Welcome everybody to the Johnson Matthey Platinum Group Metals Conference, Critical to the Future of Sustainable Technology. So what is the role of PGMs in the future technologies or those technologies that are going to allow us to have a beautiful, sustainable and successful future as human beings on our wonderful planet? My name is Dr. Sarah Gordon. Now, before we get started, or basically the bit that you have all been waiting for, because of course this is a conference and Emma, I'm going to invite you to maybe say some words against this particular slide. Uh, because of course this is a Johnson Matthey conference, there is a little bit of a legal disclaimer we need to flash up at the beginning in front of you. We will put this into chat as well if any of you want to read this in detail. However, we're going to stop sharing and relinquish the stage to Emma to say some words of welcome. Thank you very much. So. When I introduced the first session of the conference yesterday, I mentioned that in the PGM industry, as in all industries, there are questions and there are myths that abound. And one of the purposes of this conference is to try to settle some of these. And I'm delighted that we've got more than a thousand people registered because hopefully we'll be able to spread the message globally about this global industry. One of the myths that I encounter quite often talking to other industries, talking to policymakers and some academics, is that the circular economy of platinum group metals is sorted, isn't it? Platinum group metals are more extensively recycled than most other metals, so why do we need to worry about them? So I'll agree that the closed loop model of PGM recycling is a step in the right direction. In closed loop recycling, the customer buys the metal uses it for the lifetime of the process, then lends it back to the recycler who turns it back into pure PGM and credits the customer. This gives us way better metal recovery than the open loop model. In that model, which is the one we use for catalytic converters, for medical implements, uh, for many catalysts, we send the metal out into the world and can only hope that one day it will come back to us. It might end up in a tractor rusting in a field, it might end up in a spark plug getting shredded along with the rest of the car and it's lost. Given the importance of PGMs to the world's future, that's not a direction we want to go. I should add that, as Marge Ryan said in her fantastic talk yesterday, that we don't include the amounts of PGM that are in the closed loop recycling circuit in supply and demand figures we publish in the PGM market report. And I do appreciate that this is the cause of some frustration to people who are trying to put a comprehensive picture together as P of PGMs as critical materials. But I'm afraid as it's commercially sensitive information, it's something that we can't share. One way, um, one of the tools which helps to understand the true circular economy of PGMs is life cycle assessment, LCA. This is an excellent way to get a complete picture of what's being used, of how it's being recycled, and what part of the cycle genuinely has the greatest environmental impact. We have two excellent speakers this morning who will be talking about the life cycle assessment of platinum group metals. The International Platinum Group Metal Association have been collecting data from its members for, I think, more than a decade in order to be able to understand the life cycle of PGMs in their current major application catalytic converters. And Tanya is going to take us through the conclusions for those studies. Please put your hands together for the fantastic Tanya Bossi. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just to check, can you hear me and can you see my slide? We can okay, indeed. Great. Okay. Good morning and thank you for the great opportunity to speak at this exciting conference. I followed it yesterday and I really, I'm still learning every day from talking to or having uh, people talk and listen to them. Um, so my name is Tanya Bossi. Uh, I'm Senior Manager Sustainability at the International Platinum Group Metals Association, the IPA. For those who have now not heard about the IPA, um, the IPA represents the whole value chain of the PGM industry from mining to fabrication and recycling. And John Smethy is one of our members. As an association, we bring together PGM players across the supply chain to collaborate on issues relevant to the industry, be it risk monitoring, following and influencing regulations, be it occupational health and science research or security challenges such as PGM thefts or sustainability performance. And LCA is one part of that. 
So sustainability is tackled from different angles at the IPA, not only from an en environmental perspective, but also with a big focus on social aspects, governance and contributions of the PGM industry to economic growth and well-being. So what we do, for example, is we collect best practices um, in a lot of fields from education, water management, hydrogen powered mining equipment, income generating initiatives for communities and so on. So if you're interested in ESG at an industry level, I just invite you to check our website. You will find it at the end of this presentation. My topic today, however, is the life cycle assessment of PGMs. And I've been involved in all um, projects undertaken at industry level from 2011 to today. So basically all life cycle assessments that have been performed at an industry level in the role of a project manager. But I have to add that my background is communication. So I did not do the uh, data analysis myself. This is typically done um, as in other associations by an external consultancy. So that means I will not be able to answer very technical questions. Um, and also, I want to focus more on LCA as a tool um, in the context of circular economy and not so much on methodology as such. So that is a um, warning for those who want to see a very complicated slides and maybe a welcome to those who are more interested in understanding what that can do for the industry and why PGMs are actually so wonderful as an example of LCA um, practice in use. So I'm just going to move forward with my slides. Here's a brief overview on what I plan to cover for the next 20 minutes. A short introduction into LCA and what it's used for. The PGM's Industries LCA road. Using LCA data to show the net benefits of PGM's in an application. And as mentioned, um, we take the automotive catalytic converter as example because this is the single biggest application in terms of demand for PGMs. And we have a wealth of knowledge, of course, in that area. And LCA in the context of circular economy, just generally. And finally, some latest developments, both from an industry perspective, but also what is happening in the world around us um, from stakeholders in the field of LCA. So don't worry if I might move a little bit quick in my slides. And there's a lot of text on it because I offer this presentation for download, so you can check all of this by yourself um, once I have finished. So what is LCA? I, a life cycle assessment is a methodology for assessing the potential environmental impacts associated with all stages of the life cycle of a product, process or service. So um, potential in that case means these impacts can occur, but they don't have to. So it's approximations that we're looking at. LCA is part of life cycle thinking and hence of the circular economy concept. It's a product centered approach and important. It's more than just carbon footprint because that is what stakeholders often kind of put their focus on, but it's a lot more. It involves a lot more of data collection than just um, assessing the carbon footprint of a process. It looks at many different environmental impact categories, that's what we call it, um, like, for example, on blue water consumption, on acidification potential, abiotic depletion, and so on. And it's just one element in assessing sustainability, but clearly not the only one. Social aspects as contributions to economic growth, economic development, investment into communities and governance are also key to assess the sustainability performance of production, whether it be it primary production or secondary production. So LCA or LCAs have become a valuable decision supporting tool for both policymakers and industry in assessing the impacts of a product or process. And drivers of this evolution are, for example, the move of government regulations in the direction of life cycle accountability. That is the notion that a manufacturer is actually not only responsible for direct production impact, but also for the impacts associated with product use, product inputs, transport and disposal. An example for this is the EU's plan to make reporting on CO2 life cycle emissions of vehicles mandatory by 2028 or later, and also its goal to present a common methodology for the assessment of these emissions, including also the fuels and energy consumed. So in the past, tailpipe emissions were at the center of regulation, and the focus was definitely on the use phase of a car. But today, regulation shifts towards looking at the whole life cycle of a car, including the production of raw materials used. 
On the other hand, the EU has also decided that only cars that are CO2 neutral in their operation can be registered in the EU as new cars from 2035 on. Another driver is business participating in voluntary initiatives which contain LCA and product stewardship components, for example, ISO 1400. Companies are increasingly conducting their own life cycle assessments, or more specifically, product carbon footprint assessment, as demand for data from downstream users is growing. Customers are using the data themselves to calculate the footprint of PGM products, such as autocatalysts, chemical catalysts, or fuel cells. And results from our industry LCAs can be used also by companies as a baseline scenario to formulate a net zero CO2 strategy and also to engage with their customers and their investors on that strategy. The company specific results that are created while we do an industry study can be used as a baseline to build a carbon reduction plan or carbon disclosure that also includes scope three emissions up and downstream. And at the same time, industry studies can help to raise awareness amongst members for upcoming reporting requirements, especially from the EU, such as metals emissions to air and water, emissions from tailings, etc., and also to identify data gaps. In other words, we work together here as a group to share knowledge and ensure we produce the best data for our stakeholders and improve this data in each round of update. And as we heard from Emma, it's also being used internally, of course, by, by our members to see and assess hotspots and find a solution for that. Because as she mentioned, sometimes it's quite astonishing where your actual footprint or the biggest impact comes from. So don't worry, I'm not going to talk you through this slide completely. It contains um, some historic information on the IPA LCAs, which is more for background. So we'll jump, just summarize some of it. So while conducting the first study on fiscal year 2010 production data, the concern was widespread in the industry that, that publishing separate results on carbon footprint and energy demand of primary produced PGMs would actually make uh, customers stop buying them and switch to only recycled metal. So in order to learn from the whole process, we were new to that, of conducting an LCA and from using the results internally to understand them and so on, it was decided to produce only an aggregate, aggregated average data set, which means primary and secondary production results were combined in a mix. And this study covered 64% of the global supply of platinum, palladium, and rhodium. And the ratio of the data was nine to five, primary to secondary volumes in terms of reported volumes. The main de uh, demand for LCA data actually came from the OEMs wanting to calculate the footprint of different materials and including the autocatalyst and also model future applications such as fuel cell electric vehicles. And the disadvantage of only having aggregated data became apparent quite clearly. They were not able to give credits to recycling in their calculations. And they were pretty upset about that. Because in the life cycle calculation, you can give a credit to the avoided impact from primary production each time you reuse the PGMs. For example, in a chemical catalyst, where we have already heard, you can use the material almost endlessly. And thereby, you can reduce your impact considerably, of course. But in order to do this, of course, you need to know both the primary impact number and the secondary impact number. If a product is made from a mix of primary and secondary PGM, like the autocatalyst, only impacts of primary metal production are attributed to the product. And the recycled portion remains burden-free, which, of course, makes using recycled material very attractive. This is why some years later, the LCA update on 2017 production data featured separate data, set on, data sets on primary and secondary production right from the start. For both studies, we also performed an application study on autocatalyst, our biggest single application, covering diesel and gasoline engines in 2010. This was for a system meeting the Euro, Euro 5 um, emission standard and in 2017 meeting the Euro 60 temp emission standard. You have um, the assumptions on the slide, and I will talk about this a little bit later as well, about the lifetime of the vehicle and the PGM loadings. We did choose autocatalysts because first, they're still the most important single application in terms of demand. And second, we had 19.90% of autocatalyst producers represented in our membership, which is very important in terms of credibility and representation if you conduct an LCA a generic LCA on a product 
And third, it is effective on emissions. So we could calculate emissions produced versus emission avoided, which is a great concept in the circularity of the product. So when performing an LCA, you must define the system you're looking at, the so-called system boundary for the life cycle inventory. The life cycle inventory is the collection of inputs and outputs to the system. And you have to define the functional unit, which is the unit that defines to which product unit you attribute the impact results. As you can see in uh, the red borders, this is the system boundaries of primary production and secondary production. So that was what we had in focus. And you see the processes, mining, concentration, smelting, and so on. Um, the base metal refinery step and the precious metals refinery step. There is an allocation taking part um, in that area, but I'm not going to talk about this because it's quite complicated. I have some informative slides um, on the back of my presentation that I will make available for download. Um, so here you can see the system boundary and the functional unit, um, which is in the middle, is one kilogram of, of each platinum, palladium and rhodium. Later, we also added iridium and uh, ruthenium, but I will come back to this later. Byproducts occurring during, during the production of PGMs, such as base metals, which you can see outside of the red border, were treated by means of this allocation, and they are outside of the boundaries. We used a cradle to gate approach, which means that we assessed the life cycle from mining or refining to the production of the saleable product at the gate. So transport afterwards to the customer, use, disposal, this is all not included. In our autocatalyst studies, we included the production of the salt for the wash coat, as well as of the autocatalyst itself and assessed the benefits in the use phase. I'll give some more details on the benefits later on. Always lose my mouse here. Okay. So here you can see in a nutshell the results for the main impact cate categories for primary produced PGMs. The results are presented in grams. This is because um, PGMs are usually uh, used in grams and not in kilograms. As you can see, it's not only carbon footprint, but um, as in this as an example, we have 31.7 kilogram of global warming potential measured in CO2 equivalent per gram of platinum. So that is quite high, it's a high footprint. If considered in isolation, it's high, but of course balanced in the circularity of the metal, which you will understand in a while, um, it's actually quite low because the recycling due to that is value driven due to the high um, value of the metal. And I will show you the impact of recycled platinum in a bit. We unfortunately cannot really compare the results between the two studies we performed regarding the environmental performance because we added more sites in the second study and also additional companies. And we also had higher volumes of PGMs reported, 40% more primary PGMs in the second study and 130% more recycled PGMs. But what can be said when comparing the results between 2010 and 2017 data is the platinum primary energy demand rose by 8%, and global warming potential by 13% due to the worsened quality of the electricity grid in South Africa in 2017. And the main source of electricity in South Africa is burning hard coal still, which accounted to over 83% of energy generation in 2017. The, bit, the good news about this is it's gonna change. For palladium, the primary energy demand fell by 21% and global warming potential by 23% as a result of including Russian production in the second study. In Russia, a lot of natural gas and hydropower is used, and this has, in total, a lower carbon footprint. For those companies who participated in both studies, we can say electricity consumption fell by roughly 20% as a result of their increased efficiency. So that was a good news. The data you see here in the table has been updated with background data from uh, the Gabi database. It's a life cycle database which collects all kind of upstream data, background data on energy, um, electricity mix on consumed materials. So that is always kept up to date. And it's a good tool if you don't want to perform a new study every year that you just update the background data. So you immediately see in your results, um, the result of change in electricity grids of um, reduced um, materials consumed and so on. So it's a way to kind of update your data as you go. 
With the hydrogen economy gaining momentum and iridium being used in PEM electrolyzers for the production of hydrogen, we saw increased interest also in iridium data. So that last year, we produced a data set on primary iridium and ruthenium out of our 2017 data submission. So that is why you can see also iridium and ruthenium on this slide. Here are the results for the secondary production route. As you can see, the global warming potential of secondary platinum is just 339 grams of CO2 equivalent for one gram of platinum, compared to 31 kilogram for primary. For the secondary data, the 2017 data was more robust, and we were also able to cover more types of secondary feeds than in our first study. But the changes with updating um, the background database, Gabi, uh, here were rather marginal. So there's, there are no big changes in that. And you will be able to download these results as well. And for everyone who is interested in the full data set, um, you can get it if you just uh, go to our website, fill out a questionnaire, or just drop me an email, and I will send you the data. Or you can download it or access it in the Gabi database. So. What are the main sources of impact? The main source for global warming potential, which is the one thing I will focus on today, is the purchased electricity in the production processes for both primary and secondary production. So power consumption during mining and all beneficiation for primary production is the, singles, is the biggest single contributor to the overall impact. And as I explained, um, there is not a lot that um, miners could do in the past about this because they were bound to use electricity from ESCOM, which was over 83% hot coal uh, based. Um, but now to a limited extent, they are allowed to invest and generate their own electricity based on solar, wind power, hydrogen, or other renewable sources. And I think we heard from Nelsa yesterday a lot about the wonderful um, hydrogen projects and hubs that are opening up in South Africa. So um, I think that will be a way to unlock South Africa's potential as green energy producer. And we will see during, for the next couple of years, uh, the results of the decarbonization effects on, also in the results of our update we're performing, or will be performing also in the future. So summing up, energy transition will be the key factor to reducing the CO2 footprint. Decarbonization strategies are in place, both um, at primary and secondary producer level. So net zero goals, depending on who you ask, will be um, 2033 to 2050. Of course, it depends on the operation you have. If you have a very deep mine, um, you might be a little bit later with your net zero goal. Energy use has al already um, decreased. So energy efficiency is also one key aspect here. And um, we will hear that again and again, secondary production and recycling plays a really important role in lowering the environmental footprint of primary production. So as you have seen in the result table before, the unit footprint for PGMs is high um, and it's higher than for most other metals. On the, other, on the other hand, the amount of annual PGM production is very small compared to other commodities. And we put together this infographic when we disclosed our results for 2017. So this relates to 2017 production. As you can see, it was very tiny for the precious metals. And for PGMs, it was 450 tons of uh, yearly production. And um, I think we heard yesterday, I, I have in my notes for 2020, um, the production volume of PGMs was 400 tons. So that was over 6,000 times less than the output of nickel, which was 2.5 million tons of nickel for 2020. Now, if you compare the weight of PGMs used in a catalytic converter, which is what you see here with the car, um, with an average loading of three to nine grams of PGMs, depending on the catalyst type and of your engine, the overall, uh, if you compare to the overall weight of the car, which is roughly one to two tons, it's really small. And also compared to the metal loading of an electric vehicle battery, which is over 200 kilogram of metals. However, as has been stressed yesterday, also in the supply and demand sessions, circularity is already established in the recycling of PGMs due to their high value. And as a side effect of the high value on the recycling of PGMs, also other material from scrap are being recycled 
less valuable material that would otherwise not be recovered. So there's also an added benefit to other metals and other materials. When performing a life cycle assessment, you ideally also want to examine the life cycle impact and show the benefits of the use phase of the material you are producing. In other words, you aim to demonstrate that the material or metal or product is at best balancing its burden of production. In the PGM industry, autocatalysts are the single application with the biggest demand for PGMs still. And I'm showing here the gasoline vehicle of our 2017 study as example. You can see the assumptions uh, we took on in the left hand box. So it was um, a 6D temp vehicle, uh, four way and three way catalysts were included. The PGM loading was roughly three gram per PG of PGMs per catalyst. And we used a usual market mix of 70% primary material and 28% recycled metal in the catalyst. And the graph now shows you the emissions generated by the production of the catalyst on the left-hand side, the changes of these emissions during the use phase in the middle, and finally, the balance or net emissions. So as you can see, um, the autocatalyst production causes 65 kilogram of CO2 in its production. And uh, there is more CO2 coming up in the use phase, of course, due to burning fuel and the consumption of fuel and the uh, production of fuel. And uh, still, there is no benefit in um, the net emissions bar if it comes to CO2. But you can see there are a lot of benefits when it comes to other emissions. And I will show you a different view on that just in a second. The catalyst has no positive effect on the generation of CO2 because the main amount of CO2 is produced during the use phase of the vehicle through fuel combustion and the production of the fuel, as I said. So here you get a different view on the same results, but focusing on the avoided emissions through the use of the autocatalyst. And as an additional metric, the left-hand box, um, we calculated the break-even point for our model cars, which is the driving distance uh, you need to drive where in-use benefits outweigh the impacts of production. And this is for carbon monoxide, 7.5 kilometers of driving, for NOx is 100 kilometers, and hydrocarbon is 2.5 kilometers, which means after that distance, you have already kind of offset um, the emissions of the production of the catalyst. And in total, one gasoline vehicle, Euro 60 temp, removes uh, 1,464 kilogram of toxic emissions in its lifetime of 160,000 kilometers driving. And just on a side note, as an example of other activities we're doing at the IFPA, um, in a joint project with um, the Association of Emissions Control by Catalyst, AECC, we have shown ourselves with two demonstrator cars that actually near zero emission diesel and gasoline vehicles can be built if the necessary catalytic equipment is put together. In addition, if you use um, sustainable fuels, fuels um, you can also really get down the CO2 emissions very, very considerably, and that would be a good option. So how does LCA fit into the circular economy context? It's a good tool to show the decreased burden from life cycle to life cycle, especially if you have an almost endless recyclability as PGMs have. It helps to advocate for more efforts to recycle more metal. However, in reality, even a very ambitious recycling strategy for PGMs will not completely lead to substitution of primary produced metal through recycled metal because PGM containing products, as we know, typically last some years so the metal is bound in the product, as in an autocatalyst or chemical catalyst, and some of them are reused in closed loop applications, such as the chemical catalyst, and therefore not available as supply to the market. Primary metal production fills this gap between availability of secondary material and the total demand. I think this has all been perfectly explained by March in a presentation about supply and demand yesterday. The LCA data can, however, help to show the improvements of the industry in many areas, not only on carbon footprint, but also in reducing water use, waste, and also in increasing efficiency of processes. It helps users of our data to model new applications or also to update the impact of existing ones with more use of renewable energy. So you can build scenarios with that. And when it comes to circularity, I think we must also look at it in a more holistic way 
not only focus on the product and avoiding waste of the product, but also on the sustainability of primary production, the so-called process circularity, in the context of a just transition where benefits and economic growth, development are distributed globally, and countries where PGMs are mined also get their fair share. And lastly, I've listed here the latest developments concerning LCA, once for the PGM industry and with, with regard to our stakeholders. So the IPA has just launched its third study in April on 2022 production data for primary production of platinum, palladium, rhodium, ruthenium and iridium, and the secondary production of the same excluding iridium. That is because we only have two players that recycle iridium in our membership, uh, in, in, in the participating um, group of members, and that is why we cannot disclose that data. We are currently also working on a guidance document on how to calculate the carbon footprint of primary PGMs for the use by external parties. So that has also been performed by other industries, by the Nickel Institute, by Zinc. It's actually to help uh, ensure that results are comparable and follow the same kind of harmonized metal way that uh, we as metal associations have agreed would be the best way forward. I've listed some other activities from um, stakeholders that maybe I leave here for you to read for, you, for yourself um, in, for the sake of time. But I think summing up, it's fair to say that the interest in LCA data is increasing at many, many different levels. So I hope I could give you an informative first overview on that topic, and I'm open to questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was brilliant and a really, really good overview, I think, with regards to all the fantastic work that you're doing. Round of applause, everybody. So put your hands together for the brilliant Tanya. 